Good evening, and we're back with more of Hall Monitor here on WPPM 106.5. I'm Denise Clay Murray, and I'm joined by my co-host Larry McGlynn, and we're and we're joined by Cindy Bass, Councilwoman for the Eighth Councilmanic District, which includes like Germantown Avenue and 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 places like Mount Airy and stuff, places that you you go north and you check them out. And um, we wanted to have you on to talk a little bit about the most recent budget cycle, because, you know, count, uh, as we're recording this, council has just finished its last meeting for the year. Yes. And, and we wanted to find out from you, you know, just what, whether, I guess, whether or not you think that council did everything it had to do this year and, and what's what's next for you in terms of next year and, and over the summer. So I guess my first question for you, um, over the last couple, over the last week or so, we have heard you talk about rebuild and yes. what it's not necessarily doing in terms of um, recreation centers, not only for the city, but specifically for your district. Um, has that been straightened out at all? And does, does that reflect in this budget? Well, it, it uh, has been reflected uh, in this budget. There's been uh, some, some uh, additions made that would uh, make the 8th District whole, but it's, it's a start. I want to just say that for sure. It's not the finish. And for those who may not be aware, this uh, matter came to light uh, last week when we had a hearing with the uh, Executive Director of Rebuild and asked uh, for the umpteenth time what was the spending per district? Because Rebuild started out as a $500 million program. Um, and along the way, that's shrunken down to 425. But if you divide that by 10 districts, that's uh, $42.5 million per district. And that's kind of the way we had assumed it was going to be spent, but we wanted to be sure that everyone was getting their fair share. We knew that some districts, particularly along uh, sort of like the river wards, Fishtown, uh, Northern Liberties, parts of South Philadelphia, East of Broad, and Northeast Philadelphia, Bridesburg, so all those kinds of communities, um, which have historically um, had, you know, higher levels of investment by the city, didn't need as much. Um, and then you have sort of like the rest of the city, primarily Black and Brown neighborhoods that had a, a significant need. And so the question was, uh, when, when it came to light that we were receiving so much less funding than everyone else, why is that and who made these decisions and what was the uh, decision-making process? So, um, you know, we've, we've uh, you know, we're on a path to have a, a fair funding for the 8th District, but we still need to answer those questions as to how did we even arrive here in the first place that my district would receive 20 to $30 million less than comparable districts. Um, you know, that's a question that still has not been asked by the administration. And I did say in the hearing before we passed the resolution out of committee uh, on Tuesday that, uh, you know, if we don't have those answers, we, you know, I, I, I don't wanna hold anything up, but at the same time, the people, the citizens, the taxpayers deserve an answer to how these decisions are being made. Now, what are you hearing from your constituents when it comes to the recreation centers in your district? They're, they're, listen, whether it's my district or throughout the city, for the most part, people are very unhappy with the conditions. People feel that these are substandard conditions. They haven't been addressed in decades, not years, decades, uh, uh, plural on the end there, S on the end. And so the rebuild, we were all very excited when the idea came along that we were gonna have new recreation centers and playgrounds and libraries and this and that and the other. But, um, you know, a, a fairness is important. Equity is important. Making these decisions in a way that's really going to, you know, lift the entire city is the right thing to do. And I have to say citywide, uh, I got a lot of support throughout the entire city. I got support from people uh, who work at, within the city, within the Department of Parks and Recreation and who are working on these projects. I got support um, all around the city of Philadelphia with people saying you're doing the right thing and keep going because what has happened is totally unfair and they got it. They got it and they got it immediately that uh, you know the way this money was divvied up was not uh, appropriate. Now, when we talk about the city's gun violence issue, which is which is still top of mind for a lot of people. 
one of the suggestions that's always made or often made is that we provide more for kids to do. Mm -hmm. And that means more programs like job programs, more recreation programs, more of that kind of thing. In the committee that you that you um, chair, the, the recreation parks and recreation committee, mm -hmm. are you all talking about those th about this kind of about gun violence from that perspective? And if so, what is it that you would like to see done? Well, obviously, we would like to see a lot more programming in our, our recreation centers and and in our libraries and um, you know uh, the playgrounds, you, you know and. Uh, uh, working with Parks and Rec is critically important. I have great relationships with all of the rec center leaders in my district, but at the same time, through the administration, some of these centers aren't open. They're not open on, in the amount of hours that they need to be open. They need to be open almost around the clock. And I'm when I say almost around the clock, they may need to open at seven or eight in the morning until, you know, nine or 10 o'clock at night. I know we just uh, put a new curfew in. So whatever the new curfew hour is, I think it's 10 o'clock. But those uh, recreation centers and playgrounds need to be open and fully staffed for all of those hours. Um, the other part to crime and violence um, though, and I, I do wanna pivot just a little bit into something that we've been working on in my office, which is a, a sort of like a public service campaign around uh, uh, guns and guns in the home and the age of these shooters. Our campaign is called, what do you do when the shooter lives with you? And so the idea behind that is that a lot of these shooters, a lot of these victims, a lot of people who are involved in this deadly game of gunplay are minors. And so they're young. Um, those who aren't minors are still young. They're 18, 19, 20, 21, early 20s. They're living at home. They're not apartment dwellers on their own or homeowners. They live with someone. And so we say that, you know, parents, guardians, caregivers, whoever, you know, we need for you to go in that room, as we call it, run that room, you know, flip up that mattress, look in that closet. You know, when I was growing up in my mother's house, there was no such thing as privacy at all. And so we need for parents to jump in there and say, listen, you know, I'm going to do what I need to do to save my child's life or keep them out of jail and save somebody else's child's life. And so we need to figure out ways that we can get uh, more engaged, get more parents, more caregivers engaged into addressing that issue. Because again, they're living with somebody. These guns are being hidden in homes and uh, we, need, we need action. So, and, and that's a good point that you're making about, you know, the fact that these, that there are people living, you know, among these folks with the, um, with the guns, but that's been the case for a while. How do we get parents or brothers or sisters or friends to say, you know, I know that you did something with this gun and I know that that's wrong and I need to talk to the police about it. How do you get to that? How do we get past the snitches get stitches point? Well, if it's your parent, your caregiver, your, your grandparents you're living with, then, you know, like, listen, what we're, what we're suggesting, what I'm suggesting is some things you, you can handle at home. And you don't want to call the police. Listen, you, if I go in a room and I see my 18 year old son uh, has a gun stuffed under his mattress, I don't want to call the police. I don't want to get the police involved. I want to handle it outside of calling the police on my child, having them go into the system, maybe having them incarcerated. I want to uh, figure out how can I handle that. So that's what this campaign is really going to be all about, about getting them the tools and the information to help you handle a situation that is happening in your home with a young person who lives in your home. Keep them out of the system as much as possible and keep them away from, like I said, that deadly gunplay that's claiming so many lives here in the city of Philadelphia. Okay, um, I'm going to turn it over to Larry. Larry, you got any questions? Thank you, Denise. Uh, Councilmember, thank you for being with us. Thank you um, for the invitation. So, so the city budget has been finalized. Um, are you satisfied with how it turned out? And what are you looking at as big successes in this budget? Well, um, let me just say this. I think when you look at this budget and when you look at the city's way of budgeting, um, we've been, in my opinion, overtaxing and overtaxing for years. And you see that in the end result where every year we project that we're going to end up with, let's say, $50 million in the fund balance, and we end up with $150 million. 
or 200 million or 300 million. And it's year in and year out. I don't have the exact figure in front of me, but I believe in the Kenny administration, we've had an, an extra, I'll say close to a billion dollars, like $900 million or something like that over the last uh, six, seven years or whatever it's been. Um, and so that's that's a lot of money. That says to me that we are over budget, o- over taxing um, the citizens of the city of Philadelphia. And so I do see that the cuts to the wage tax, to the BERT tax, um, you know, the efforts to reduce the impact of the assessments, real estate assessments, I see those as wins so that we don't continue the overtaxation. But I still think that the amount uh, that, that we did add in taxes with those assessments is problematic. There's going to be some repercussions to that. We do know that there are some people who are not going to be able to afford um, you know, the, the uh, uh, increases. There has been conversation among council about the creation of a fund. We'll see how that works. That's yet to be seen yet. I'm, I'm not a big you know, fan of it. If we can slash the tax in a way that just makes sense up front, then I would say, let's just do that. Let's just do what makes sense, what's easy to understand. And what doesn't require folks who may not be as savvy or be, you know, uh, have internet access or whatever the process is going to be that you have to navigate to be able to access um, those funds to help you save your home in that $10 million pot. You know, we know that there's going to be some people who are going to be lost in the sauce and not able to access um, those funds or that program. So um, I say, let's do what makes sense. Let's do what's right. Let's do what's easy for our constituents and the taxpayers. And um, it's yet to be seen if that's what will result as a, uh, you know, from this program. And, and the last thing I'd like to ask you about, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you put up a resolution uh, talking about the Atwater Kent Museum. Correct. And that's something we covered here on the show literally the week before you did that. Um, so it, it, it's interesting. Um, what do you think is likely to happen now um, in this process? So we've gotten a lot of conversation uh, from folks uh, from the Drexel University side, from uh, the advocate and act- activist community. Um, and so what we've done is we're going to bring those folks together. So in early July, we're bringing everybody to the table. Um, you know, our uh, office is going to be there sort of like making sure that uh, things are done in a way that makes sense. We think we can do that. We think that, uh, you know, we can get all the parties there. Um, you know, Drexel University, which is going to really be responsible, the responsible party, the big, big party that's going to be responsible in all of this, uh, has given us the signal that they are going to be working closely with the activist community. We're going to be there to oversee that and make sure, and to make sure that, um, you know, the valuable treasures are going to, not going to just be discarded. Uh, and I think that that's really what the fear is. That's really what the concern is. Um, and, you know, as I say, one man's trash is another man's treasure. So just because it may not have any value to me, it may be super valuable to you. And uh, we're going to make sure that, that that those feelings are respected. OK, I'd like to turn it back over to Denise Clay Murray. I, I, I have one final question for sure. you. Sure. And it's kind of a question that we ask as a standard question around here, because we see that the 2023 mayor's race is already starting to heat up <laughs> and um, I can guess this question can I so <laughs> are you are because you've been banning the battles one of the people that's considering making a run for the office are you still thinking about that well and, as you know I cannot say uh what my thoughts are which way I'm leaning um but I will tell you that I love the work that I do I'm born and raised in the city I love the city and I want to see it do better and I think it can do better um, so whether I'm here in council or in another position, you know, I'm going to work hard for the citizens and I'm going to fight for them all the way. Okay. Thank you. We, we really appreciate long. your time. Council, council member, Cindy, Cindy Bass. Thank you for sharing some time with us and we'll be back with more of Hall Monitor in a moment. Thank you.